everyone welcome to take charge of your health and to another program last one for the year i'm your host sosa stojkovic today we're talking about humble water and its many benefits that are often overlooked and we have dr clark back on the channel sharing amazing information on how this simple natural remedy can be used for healing and health so Welcome to the program, Dr. Clark. Thank you for being back. How has your week been since, we, since we've seen you last? Well, we always keep very, very busy. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so uh, it's been quite a week, uh, but we've uh, made it through the weekend and we're happy, always happy for the Sabbath. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, praise God for the Sabbath, that's true. Um, so, yeah, we're looking forward to talking about water. And like I said, it's often overlooked, the many benefits, but we know that there, it's very versatile and it can be used in many ways to maintain and restore health, right? Oh, yes, it's a great blessing. And uh, we call it hydrotherapy because it's a therapy. It's a, Every time you drink water, you're giving yourself good therapy. Mm -hmm. That's true. We don't even realize that. And it's one of the cheapest, not, um, it's, it's one of the cheapest remedies, if not almost free of charge. So um, we're looking forward to learning more. And um, let's start with a word of prayer and get into um, the presentation. Dear Lord, we want to thank you again for another opportunity to come together and st study the natural remedies, those wonderful natural and simple remedies that you have given us, and one of them is water. We thank you for our speaker, Dr. Clark, that he is here again to share another wonderful presentation about those natural remedies. Please bless him, and again, Bless us as well, each one of us, as we um, listen and help us to be able to um, use the wonderful information we learn in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to put up my screen. Hydrotherapy or water therapy. That's our topic uh, today. And uh, <laughs> reminds me when we used to uh, travel around the United States, we were out in Maryland and there was a place uh, where we were doing meetings. We parked our caravan behind somebody's house and the next door neighbor came out of their house walking wearing a medical boot. Well, that got our curiosity. My wife said, well, why are you wearing a medical boot? And the lady said, well, I've got a serious uh, diabetic foot ulcer. And if I don't get it taken care of, they're going to have to amputate my foot. In fact, I got to go back to the doctor on Friday and schedule surgery. Well, my wife said, if, if we can do some hydrotherapy for you, we could probably save your foot. The lady said, oh, I'd be happy to try anything. So we went over there and did some hot and cold treatment on her foot. And then we uh, put on a charcoal poultice and then a fig poultice and more hydrotherapy. What was the hydrotherapy? Well, we got a big stock pot <laughs> that uh, we could fill with water. We found an, uh, uh, you know, an uh, a, a esky uh, igloo. Uh, uh, to put uh, cold water in, and so we put hot water in the stock pot and 
cold water in the esky and and started doing three minutes hot one minute cold put her foot in the hot water for three minutes put it in the cold for one minute went back and forth back and forth i think we did it five times and ended with cold and uh well, by the end of the week, when she went back to see her doctor, he said, well, it's doing so much better. Let's just keep on, see if it doesn't heal up. So she had saved herself a, a surgery. And so hydrotherapy is using water. God's miracles do not always bear the outward semblance of miracles. Often they are brought about in a way which looks like the natural course of events. When we pray for the sick, we also work for them. We answer our own prayers by using the remedies within our reach. Water, wisely applied, is a most powerful remedy. It is used intelligently. As it is used intelligently, favorable results are seen. God has given us intelligence, and he desires us to make the most of his health giving blessings so what is hydrotherapy hydrotherapy may be defined as the use of water in any of its forms well what are its different forms ice steam liquid water okay so those are different forms for the maintenance of health or for the treatment of disease Hot water applied to the body dilates local blood vessels and increases blood flow, relieving pain, congestion, muscle cramps, and inflammation. It moves blood by attracting it to the place of warmth and by a reflexive action. So there you go. You want water to move somewhere? Heat up that area. It's kind of like in the summer. You know, the back of your hands, the blood vessels stand out because of the heat. Um, same is true if you heat the body artificially. The blood vessels get bigger. That's what we mean by dilate, and more blood comes to that area. On the other hand, if we put cold water, when it's applied to the body, it tends to constrict local blood vessels and decrease local blood flow. It moves blood away from the area, both by local effects and by reflex action. What do I mean by reflex action? Well, you have blood vessels on the surface that will feel the heat and change. But you have blood vessels deep inside that may not feel the change in temperature on the surface. But the nerves going to them are also connected to the nerves going to the surface. And uh, that connection makes it so the deep down blood vessels will also change in their diameter, either constricting or opening up, depending on the temperature on the surface. So this way we can affect the blood vessels in the lungs, in the heart, in the kidneys, in the intestines by changing the temperature on the surface. It's the reflexive action. Now there's an important uh, rule of thumb that we want to introduce here, and that is perfect health depends on perfect circulation. I mean, many people realize that when circulation stops, so does health. I mean, that would be death, right? But people don't really realize that if circulation only partially stops, I mean, it's not flowing so well, that health won't be so good either. And so we use the temperatures to do some important things about keeping circulation good. When circulation slows down, we say that the blood is congested. And so congested blood is going to have problems. It'll, for example, it'll get inflamed. But if we use hydrotherapy, we can decongest. We can decrease inflammation, for example. The blood that is just sitting around causes inflammation, but blood that gets moving reduces inflammation. And the other thing is, is if the blood is all congested, you can get a fever just from that. Now, if we can move that blood on, get it to balance in its circulation, then we can reduce the fever. So oftentimes, a uh, a warm treatment will improve circulation throughout the body and actually reduce a fever. It's sort of counterintuitive. You'd think if they're having a fever, we better chill them, but that isn't necessarily the case. And, um, well, I'll give you an example. I had a patient came to me. He was a patient from out of town. He was from Florida. I was up in Maine. 
He came to my office because his plantar fasciitis had started flaring up. He was having pain in his heel. And um, his usual doctor down in Florida would often give him a steroid shot in the heel to clear up the inflammation. Well, he came to me saying, I want a steroid shot. Can you do it? I said, sure, I can do that. And so I gave him a steroid shot. In a couple of days, he was back. He said, it didn't do any good. Something's wrong. It didn't work. I don't know what's going on, but I certainly am having pain. I said, well, you know, that was your doctor down south way of treating it. Let me have you try something different. And I sent him home to do hot and cold treatments on his feet using five-gallon buckets. Uh, in a week, he came back. He said, wow, why didn't my doctor down in Florida tell me about this? This has cured my plantar fasciitis. It's improved the pain. And so what had happened is it removed the inflammation. It washed out the inflammation. And so let's just think more about this hydrotherapy. What are the physiological responses? When you put hot water there, the capillaries, they dilate. They get bigger. More blood flows through. The skin turns red. There's more metabolic activity. And so you are improving things. When you put the cold, it constricts the capillaries. The skin becomes a white, you know, if you please, because the, the red of the blood is gone. And the metabolic activity decreases. Uh, organs underlying this deep down inside are going to have the same effect. And, uh, and the body temperature responds accordingly. So these are things that are happening. The metabolism or body chemistry is accelerated um, and, and digestion is improved by doing this. So there are some ideas on your hydrotherapy. Now let's talk about the benefits because really we've got to figure out what to do with this hydrotherapy. What's it good for? The most effective therapy modality known to fight disease, aging, infections, and pain. How does it fight disease? Well, we said perfect health depends on perfect circulation. So therefore, disease is probably poor circulation uh, by whatever cause to some part of the body. And so we're fighting disease from the very roots of its cause. <coughs> Aging. Uh, people who use hydrotherapy uh, help to keep themselves young. Infections. This uh, will bring... Um, will bring the uh, blood to the area to fight the infection. <clears throat> when I was uh, working in the veterans hospital system in America, we'd have patients come in who had used IV drugs, like they shot heroin up in their hands in the blood vessels they could see. <clears throat> then they'd get an infection. Well, the patient would come in. I would send them to the room on antibiotics, but I'd tell them, if you go to that sink in the corner there of the room and do hot and cold treatments on your hand by running hot and cold water over your hand, you can probably save yourself a, a surgery. And I would show them how. And if they would do that, yes, they would save themselves a surgery. Wouldn't have to go in and debris the back of their hand. Uh, improves the digestive tract functions. Helps the uh, body to digest food better. Sets the stage for detoxification, which might be accompanied, will be accomplished with a, a follow-up treatment or another hydrotherapy um, intervention. Brain and nervous system toned and calmed, and especially warm baths or uh, scrubbing action with different water treatments on the skin. Heart rate is increased and strengthened. And if the heart rate's already too fast, you use cold on the chest and it'll slow it down. But uh, you want to increase and strengthen your heart, hydrotherapy can be Helpful if your heart's really bad. You don't want to get too aggressive about your hot and cold treatments. Uh, you can't overwhelm your heart. But uh, that said, the reason you're overwhelming your heart is because you're actually stimulating it. And uh, that's a good thing. Now, we'll talk a little bit about uh, mental uh, effects of, of hydrotherapy. Uh, it helps with mental clarity. First of all, if you're not drinking enough water and you're dehydrated, you're going to have trouble with your brain. And uh, incidentally, uh, you know, Isaiah says that uh, he drinketh no water and is faint. And so faintness can be dehydration. But that said, also hot and cold treatments help with mental stability. Uh, I have my patients get up in the morning. 
I have them do a uh, cool sponge bath. It helps wake them up, helps get their nerves going, helps get their circulation going, and helps their mental outlook. Uh, the immune system is strengthened and enabled, and we do whole talks on like pandemic preparedness where we talk about the benefits of hydrotherapy for these. In fact, if you go to my website, rev14.com, you'll see we have uh, uh, videos, uh, for example, on how to treat pandemic influenza or how to prevent pandemic influenza, but the one on how to treat pandemic influenza, we're demonstrating lots of hydrotherapy treatments and discussing their value for, for pandemic uh, diseases. Lymph flow is increased and activity increased. So this is like uh, when people have swelling, it's usually lymph that has uh, backed up in their tissues. And so the hot and cold mobilizes the lymph, reduces inflammation, reduces swelling, and the tissues uh, recover better. And uh, the activity of the lymph is improved, and that's good because the flow of the lymph has to do with the health of the white cells involved in disease treatment and prevention. White blood cells increase in numbers and chemistry when you do hot and cold treatments, and the lymphocytes increase in numbers, and that would be the cells of the lymph flow. So white cells are what fight disease. So if you do hot and cold treatments, this will this will increase the number of white cells circulating in your bloodstream. If you get your blood taken and they test your blood and count the white cells, you're going to have really high white count. They're going to get worried that you have some white blood cell disease. But just tell them you've been doing hot and cold treatments or don't get your blood taken anytime soon after you've been doing hot and cold treatments. Another thing it does, especially for the immune system, is it improves or increases interferon. It's your body's natural anti-inflammatory um, chemical or hormone in your body. It increases the ability and strength to resist disease, quickens uh, healing from tra trauma with uh, minimal tissue damage, and um, it decreases burn scarring after a burn. Uh, burn patients will probably not handle too hot a water, but the cold, in contrast with the, you know, as warm as they can handle, will be very helpful. So it decreases scarring, uh, quickens the healing, and increases the circulation in the capillaries. Now let's get into some uh, very specific uh, treatments. Uh, here's some different hydrotherapy treatments. And uh, first I want to talk about fever treatments. Uh, you can induce them with hot fomentations and good uh, insulating uh, clothing or, or blankets. You can use hot tubs or, or, or different types of um, tubs of water uh, with hot water to induce a fever. Or you can use other ways of doing this like a wet sheet pack or heating sheet pack where you're making the body produce the fever in response to perhaps a cold application. Then there's Russian, Russian steam baths. It's usually a portable or or temporary tent or or even fiberglass uh, enclosure where you're basically sitting inside of a enclosed area with a steam generator in there. So the steam is the heat source and it uh, raises the humidity inside the, the case. And, and then there's hot foot baths uh, can be used to induce a fever if you're well uh, insulated. Then there's contrast therapy. And what would we use? I should stop. What, what would we use fever therapies for? Well, there's a number of things that we would use fever treatments for. Uh, the most uh, important one is cancer. And uh, basically, if you can get a patient's temperature up to, uh, just thinking here, um, 40 point. Uh, Five to 41 degrees Celsius, then uh, and get hold it up there for 45 minutes, you can cause about 95% uh, of the cancer cells to go into what we call apoptosis or programmed cell death. They decide to check out, and uh, that's a, a good thing. Other things we use fever therapies for are for infectious diseases such as parasites, uh, Lyme's disease. Um, 
uh, things like that. Um, anyway, fever treatments uh, are, are, are something you need help with usually. Contrast ther therapy, so using hot and cold water, not just not just uh, hot water as in fever treatment. And when you finish a fever treatment, you always end with cold. All right, uh, contrast therapies, uh, shower or spray type. They, sometimes you do it to yourself in the shower, or there are showers where a therapist uh, uh, controls the water. There's a plunge or underwater therapy. Um, so like uh, we have a person sitting here in a hot tub. And they might go from a hot tub to a cold shower and back to hot tub and cold shower. Um, there are several ways to apply contrast. And you can do it to the extremities with hot water bottles and ice packs or towels dipped in hot or cold water. Uh, there's uh, local thermal applications, just heating or cold. Paraffin baths is another way. Another way. Cold mitten friction, taking mittens that are made out of uh, like terry cloth towel material, dipping them in ice cold water and scrubbing a patient down from their fingertips to their shoulders, their toes to their hips, their chest, their abdomen, pelvis, their back, head and neck maybe even. So water temperature and effects. So we need to talk about uh, what we're doing here at the water and what actually happens. And so let's just go through the temperatures and we'll start here with 42.8 to 46 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature of the water, and uh, it's really painfully hot when you get in that warm. Um, although I have had patients that did fever baths at 120, um, uh, well, uh, 46 degrees Celsius uh, hot water baths, and I was a bit surprised. I'd never known anybody to do that, but uh, yeah, it, it can be done. Uh, we say you start burning at above 130, so you're not going to burn yourself, but yeah, painfully hot. And what is the result to the blood flow? Well, it really constricts dramatically, which is interesting because we said when you put hot on, it usually dilates. But when you get this hot, the opposite effect happens. The body's trying to protect itself from, from that much heat. So that's sort of fascinating. Then there's uh, 40 to 42.8 uh, uh, Celsius. So this is uh, <clears throat> very hot, not painfully hot. This is what we usually do fever baths at, uh, getting your oral temperature up to, but not to 110. Um, but uh, fever baths, we might go anywhere from 110 to 120, usually around 114. This would be a hot bath. Uh, you get extreme dilation of blood vessels. <clears throat> so you got to be aware of that. All your blood's going to sort of space out into your extremities, and you could get low on blood if you're dehydrated. So we tend to give people a something to drink when we put them in this kind of hot bath for any length of time. Um, and um, so drinking water is a big part of hydrotherapy. I got to demonstrate once in a while here. So then there's just plain hot water, 100 to 104. Notice it's above body temperature. Uh, 38 to 40, so body temperature would be, you know, somewhere around uh, 36. Um, so this will cause dilation of blood vessels, but not extreme dilation. Then there's a neutral bath, kind of body temperature area, 34 to 37. And this has a calming, relaxing effect. Um, yeah, it just feels like you're sort of... Uh, at balance with your surroundings and then there's just uh, warm anywhere from 34 to 38 and uh, it's refreshing and then there's tepid we're starting to go on the cool side 27 to 34 we use this especially for wound cleansing um, and 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 the body when you take get out of a, a cool or tepid uh, bath it, it, it tends to um rebound and try to create heat and then if we get into a cool bath 21 to 27 degrees uh, then your blood vessels start constricting quite uh, quite a bit and uh, if you you know go from 13 to 21 then you're going to get therapeutic constriction you know just really tight constriction this will stop blood flow to bleeding areas and so forth 
you get into very cold, almost down to freezing, get severe constriction, and it'll start to take away pain. Now, um, take away pain. Initially, <laughs> so let's say you broke your ankle or you sprained your ankle, and it's very painful, and you're wondering how can I, you know, take care of that so that I get rid of the pain. Well, you can ice it. That would be zero degrees, right? And um, first, it'll burn on the skin. You'll think, oh man, my my skin is just burning when I put this on here. And then after you've iced it a while and it's burning about at a minute two, it'll start to ache deep down inside. The aching will, you know, be that showing that the cold is now gone from the skin down deeper. Uh, but then, as time goes on, the pain will go away, the aching will go away, the pain that you were treating will go away. Uh, keep doing it for like 15 minutes, and you'll have a totally numb extremity. And not, not, not much blood flow there either. But uh, this is a way of controlling pain and uh, treating things that hurt uh, really, really bad. So let's talk about the contrast shower a little more. It's one of the easiest things people can do because they usually have access to a shower. And it's a whole body treatment, so it can tone the whole body. And it increases the mobility of cell membrane gate openings and closings. This is like uh, calcium channels, uh, sodium channels. This is a way of improving the cell's respiration, the cell's metabolism, the cell's um, um, expelling of toxins out of themselves and so uh, we say that it uh, improves the traffic for nutrients coming in and waste going out so this is a this is a good thing uh, it strengthens and mobilizes the immune cells and their chemistry uh, you can make your white count go up uh, dramatically i've heard of stories of going up to like 40,000 which is off the charts helps build uh, muscles including the heart muscle um, it aids in detoxing and uh, cleansing the body, opens uh, and activates the skin pores so they can get rid of toxins, increases mental clarity, increases quality of brain chemistry, stimulates good hormone production and uh, utilization of those hormones, um, stimulates joints to lubricate and uh, demineralized uh, crystal buildup, like if you have calcium deposits in your tenons, therefore aiding in rebuilding the joint cartilage and reducing pain. Increases lymph circulation, increasing the ability to fight uh, infections. Enables the body to be more oxygenated and utilize oxygen more effectively. So there you go. Now let's just talk here for a minute about diabetes. Uh, heart patients, diabetics, stroke patients, trauma patients, critically compromised disease patients uh, begin easy, work into uh, more intensity over time, don't get too aggressive, uh, uh, be sure to do treatments in warm areas with no drafts, monitor your patient at all times, be prepared to, to help out the patient. Um, and uh, usually after the therapy, let them rest for a while, maybe an hour, uh, keep them covered. And um, this is a good thing. So just, uh, you know, watch your very sick patients. Don't uh, work too. And, and it's not like you have to go to extremes in temperature. Just the contrast is more important than absolute extremes. Now let's talk about a hot foot bath. And I often use a five-gallon you know, five bucket, 20-liter bucket. And um, put the water in there, uh, you know, 38 to, to 41 degrees Celsius. The goal is to get the water as high up the legs as possible. So a 20 liter bucket works good. And you just uh, make sure that uh, the water is not too deep before you put your feet in there. It might overflow. Uh, so this is a local immersion bath covering the feet, ankles, and lower ankles. And while you're doing this, the idea is to also keep the head very cool. If you got a headache, this is a great way to get rid of a headache. But uh, using this uh, treatment for other things as well. 
uh, colds, flus, uh, um, anything. It actually helps a lot of parts of the body because it's it's heating up the body and balancing the circulation, evening the circulation out to all parts of the body. So local and reflexive pathways increase the blood flow throughout the feet and entire skin surface, producing decongestion in internal organs and even the brain. And, and then that's due to the cool on the head, and that's why it helps headaches. And uh, so headaches, chest congestion, um, it'll lower the blood pressure, improves blood flow, improves lung function, relieves pelvic congestion, um, stops uh, nosebleeds, uh, aids in recovery from colds and infections of the lungs. This includes pneumonia and all respiratory uh, diseases. Improves sleep, uh, reduces psychological symptoms, improves fatigue as uh, people get very worn out. Uh, so we're talking old people, perhaps. Uh, and it helps with a fever, reduces fever. So there you go. And you use it for a number of things. You might use this hot foot bath to just do a, be a, a, a general warming. Uh, and get the body all uh, relaxed and prepare the patient for massage. Here we have somebody doing foot massage. Uh, general application of heat that might follow this or tonic procedures. Uh, you can just use it to prevent colds or, or to stop a cold. Um, it's good for aiding relaxation and comfort and to detox the body through herbs in the water. You can put any kind of herbs in the water. And uh, there's certain herbs we recommend for different things. Um, that's a whole study in and of itself. To produce sweating. And uh, you have to do the, the treatment a little longer to achieve that. And wrap the patient in blankets while you're doing this. But it's, uh, and, and sweating was a very good thing to do, especially for COVID. Uh, indications. Inflammation and congestion of the mucous membranes. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I switched from foot bath to, to steam. Okay, so that's the end of the foot bath. Now we'll talk about steam inhalation. And it can be medicated steam inhalation or just plain steam inhalation. The idea is here you get, you see a patient uh, over a pot with a, a funnel going up to their head. And the pot would be generating steam. In most cases, it would be through heat. Although you can get these, these uh, um, nebulizers or diffusers that don't use heat, um, but heat has its benefits. Uh, it reduces inflammation, congestion, the mucous membranes, the upper respiratory tract. Um, Such, so you know, if you have a runny nose, post-nasal drip, this will be helping to relieve irritation in the throat, to moisten the air, to loosen secretions, and to stimulate uh, spitting them out, which we call expectorate, to relieve spasmodic breathing, to relieve coughing, It'll relax the muscles to prevent excessive dryness of mucous membranes. Now, what do you need to do a steam inhalation? Well, it's nice to have a steam pot, um, vaporizer or kettle with a spout, uh, boiling water. And what would you put in it for medication? Eucalyptus oil is very good. And so uh, one teaspoon to a pint of oil is often recommended. I'll tell you what, uh, what I've found is if you have somebody breathing through a funnel to their steam pot, it's much better. And then you just put the eucalyptus oil on the funnel. Because if you put it in the water with the steam pot going, it'll probably just come floating out immediately like a cloud and be gone. Whereas if you put it on the funnel, then you'll keep breathing it as the steam picks it up. And you'll need a hot plate for continuous uh, heating. Uh, if you're going to do it that way, and it's nice if you're, you know, if you're you got a patient that's immobile in bed to have a bedside stand, and you can put the hot plate by the bedside, put the steam pot on the hot plate, have a hose or a cone coming to the patient, and have the patient underneath a drapery. So <laughs> fill the vaporizer or kettle with boiling water just below the level of spout. Add medication to the water or to the cone. Carry the bedside, carry to the bedside and place on the stand. Cover the spout with a cone made of newspaper to carry a steam directly to the patient or use a hose as they used in this case. And um, 
how long do you do it for? Usually a half hour to an hour, three or four times a day. This is very important to getting steam under a steam tent like this for children with respiratory tract infections. Very helpful for them. All right. To, um, so the medication, eucalyptus oil um, uh, in the cone or in the kettle for continuous inhalation, the vaporizer kettle may be placed on the floor without a paper cone. Uh, if you want, you can, you know, if it can be directly under the patient or under the bed or under the, the tent, it can get steam in the tent. What do you want to watch out for? You want to check the patient to uh, make sure they're breathing. <laughs> Don't let them, you know, get too much of this. Avoid all the risks of burning, especially children, not grabbing the pot, not touching the burner, not uh, getting too close to the steam. Avoid drafts or cold air during the time of the treatment that could sort of make the treatment less effective or counteract the treatment. Um, use extra care. Uh, when you're working with with children to avoid accidents and uh, all right uh, so that is our notes on hydrotherapy and uh, so I just want to talk about uh, some specific cases that uh, we've uh, worked with and why we worked with them that way and uh, so I want to start with a gentleman who was referred to me. Actually, his uh, wife called me and said, uh, my husband just got back from a colonoscopy, and they've given him the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis. And we were hoping for something natural we could do. They offered him pills. He doesn't want the pills. He wants to do it natural. And they said, okay, we'll have you come back in a month and uh, do another colonoscopy and check you out. And if it's still bad, then you got to take the pills. We'll give you a month to see if you can treat it naturally. All right. So amongst other things that we had him do, including charcoal and a change in diet and lifestyle, we had him doing hot and cold sitz baths. Hot and cold sitz baths would be where you take a large container that you can sit your behind in. You know, uh, um, maybe a 40-liter uh, home storage bin or something like that. And get two of them and put them in your shower or in a bathtub and fill one with hot water and one with cold water. Then you go and sit in the hot water one for, um, I usually say three minutes, and then sit in the cold water one for one minute. Three minutes hot, one minute cold, three minutes hot, one minute cold. Go back and forth, back and forth, five times and end with cold. That's what I had him doing. And um, then uh, other treatments that I mentioned there with lifestyle and charcoal. Well, within a week, his symptoms had all cleared up. No more of the symptoms that made him go to the doctor in the first place to get checked out for ulcerative colitis. So this is very effective. Uh, what does a hot sits bath do? It tends to change the blood flow through your entire chest, abdomen, and pelvis. It's very effective. We use that a lot for women who are postpartum after having had a baby. We use it for hemorrhoids. We'll use it for um, any kind of bowel issues, anywhere from cancer to ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, irritable bowel. Uh, we'll use it for anything around the pelvis that's giving trouble, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, um, um, ectopic uh, pregnancy, hopefully that, you know, you have to have more treatment than just this for that probably. Um, it could be an emergency. But um, um, yeah, and then there's anything from ovarian cysts, uh, any pain, you know, having a uh, uh, threatening an appendicitis, we would do this. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the, the things we would use this on. I mean, even anything you're trying to improve blood flow throughout the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, kidney disease, liver disease, pancreas disease. Yeah, anything where you're trying to get the blood flowing better in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, where all the organs are, that sits bath will do good for. 
another thing, uh, you know, we talked about the uh, the hot foot bath. You can combine that with charcoal fomentations to the eyes, for example. We use that for glaucoma. Instead of just doing a cold wrap on the head while the feet are in the hot water, we'll put a charcoal fomentation, which is basically a, a small bag of charcoal dipped in cold water, over the eyes for glaucoma, eye inflammation such as pars planitis, uh, iriditis, uh, even some retinopathies. Anytime we're suspecting that there's inflammation in the eyes, then this is this is a good treatment. Hot foot bath combined with a cold charcoal fomentation to the eyes. Um, I'll tell you about another story about hot sitz baths. Uh, I had a patient sent to me who was uh, having uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is a severe uh, spine problem where the joints of the spine, the, 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 the discs between the vertebra and the vertebra all sort of fuse together in one solid mass. Um, ankylosis means fused or loss of mobility in a joint or, or joint seizing up. And so this patient had ankylosing spondylitis, hadn't frozen up yet, but uh, had uh, they first got diagnosed by their doctor with an MRI showing all kinds of lesions in their spine. Uh, we're talking spinal column, uh, the bones and the discs, and uh, and the ligaments uh, holding the bones around the discs. So this patient, uh, we put on a program of uh, fixing their diet and lifestyle, but also doing hot and cold sitz baths. And did hot and cold cyst baths quite regularly, every day, a couple times a day. And uh, in six, they, they, they all cleared up, all their symptoms cleared up, but they kept doing their treatments as, as they could. And uh, then they went to see their doctor. Doctor sent them for what was considered a routine follow-up MRI. They got in the MRI machine and the tech did the scan. When they got through the scan, they said, well, just a minute. Uh, we're not sure that uh, things are quite right here with our scan. Just, 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 are you comfortable there? Just keep laying there. And they called the radiologist. They talked to him. They looked over the scan. They could. Well, finally, they said, "Nope. Oh, guess we don't need any more scans. Uh, you can, you know, let's help you out of this big machine. And, well, then the patient went to the doctor, and she had been prescribed uh, methotrexate and, you know, dangerous drugs for her condition. <laughs> and uh, the doctor asked her, have you been taking your your methotrexate and the patient, no, no, I haven't been taking it. So she got a lecture on how she should be taking her drugs and how if she didn't take her drugs, she was going to be a cripple and, and this disease is, you know, progressive. And, and then the doctor pulls up the, the x-ray uh, and the x-ray report and looks at it and looks at it and looks at it and looks at it. Finally, she says, well, the radiologist is saying, and I'm seeing that, uh, None of the previous disease for which the previous MRI was done is apparent in the current MRI. You have a clean MRI. The disease is gone. And so she got off the hook from taking the dangerous drugs. Very interesting. So hydrotherapy is a way of moving blood around the body decreasing inflammation, improving circulation. And so I'm going to stop here uh, for the time being, go back to the um, stream yard. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that information, Dr. Clark. I mean, the question we need to be asking is what can you not do with water, right? Not what can you do. It seems like we can do lots of things. We can improve um, lots of conditions with that. So um, yes. really, yeah, really good information and praise God for that. Um, yeah, so I just want to share my experience with that. Um, the only, I guess, or the most obvious one that I had was when I went to uni 
and I was um, hit with depression because I had let, uh, left my family behind. It was a different city and all of that. And they were offering swimming classes, uh, which I, I first declined. And then when I saw that the other option was um, basketball, I thought, okay, well, I'll take swimming then. Um, so as soon as I said um, I went swimming, it was just night and day how my perspective changed. Um in life and how straight away I wasn't depressed anymore. I was looking forward to going to my classes and all of that. So um, I'm not sure if it was the massaging effect of the water or just overall, um, you know, what's the evidence for swimming. But I know that one of the things that I recommend as well for people with depression is swimming. So do you have any extra comments on that, Dr. Clark? How swimming, um, is there any science to it? How swimming can help with depression? That's a good question. <clears throat> Boy, I haven't really uh, looked into the actual swimming, uh, as in doing research to see if anybody had ever studied that uh, uh, from the point of view of it being hydrotherapy. But uh, certainly, if we take uh, the principles that we talked about here and see how they would apply to swimming, it's definitely true that that would be a nice, big, cool bath. <laughs> yes, and uh, this, this would be very good at uh, improving mental outlook, at uh, boosting the immune system. Uh, the exercise itself is very important uh, for depression. Uh, exercise tends to stimulate the endorphins. Endorphins are good, feel-good hormones. It also stimulates uh, uh, bone-derived, uh, let's see, what is it, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, a factor that uh, stimulates brain healing. And so if you looked at uh, depression as having some element of uh, 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 where the brain needed to be healed, it would, it would provide for that. So there's definitely elements of that that would be, even if there wasn't research, you could say that, yeah, this would be a, a good idea yeah true and um yeah we just want to quickly remind everyone to send in your questions we we have got questions but um we have a bit of time to um answer some questions so if anyone has them in youtube in the live section in the chat section just um write them down and then dr clark can address some of them um yeah, so that's wonderful, Dr. Clark. I do remember a study. Uh, there was a documentary of a doctor that was monitoring a patient um, with depression, and she was swimming in the cold lake. So that was obviously done under supervision because really cold water in the lake, if you have any heart issues, you, you you have to kind of be monitored for that. But um, she was getting really good results swimming in the cold water. So... Um, yeah, so that was that was a good reminder that that can help. But like you said, cool water and the exercise um, as as well, they work really well together. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, and um, Dr. Clark, you were talking about hydrotherapy for the person that came to you um, with the foot that um, was it gangrenous or it was it supposed to be was it in danger of being um, amputated what was yeah. um, what was the scenario yes it was a diabetic foot ulcer on the bottom of her foot was a hole that went all the way down to the bones or up to the bones and uh, so the hydrotherapy was there to stimulate healing to help the body to fight infection uh, to improve wound healing Mm -hmm. And would you say, Dr. Clark, with someone that has diabetes and has neuropathy as well, would you have to look out for that when it comes to hot and cold? Yes, that's a very important point there, so I see, because these people don't feel the temperature. So if you're treating them, you have to be the one to decide whether it's hot or cold or how hot it is and how cold. And you want to sort of stay away from extremes, at least on heat with these people, because they can't tell you if they're getting too hot. Um, that's mm -hmm. a big problem with diabetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good reminder, I guess, for anyone that is recommending the treatment and might not be a doctor or aware of all the complications accompanying that. Um, 
And you mentioned also um, the water therapy for heart health. So that is incredible, obviously, as it is that that can help with heart health as well and strengthening heart muscle. So is it again um, hot and cold treatments on the chest? You said something that we shouldn't over, we should be careful not to overwhelm the heart. But let's say someone has weakened heart muscle or weakened valve. Uh, what would you say hot and cold would be the best therapy or? Yes, uh, well, so um, if you're trying to rehab somebody, in other words, your hope is that they will get back to a level of activity that they previous were at, but uh, congestive heart failure may have caused them to lose the ability to carry out those activities. And they're, you know, the biggest thing is eliciting their, their will on the side of recovery. But if they're into recovery and they're willing, then uh, you start with the uh, easy treatments uh, not too hot not too cold and see how they do with it that combined with exercise and probably breathing exercises uh, then uh, you can rehab them and this is a way of stimulating the heart and it's like uh, maybe they can't exercise too well themselves initially but you are in essence exercising their heart by speeding it up with your your hydrotherapy and, and so it's like exercise without uh, exercise <laughs> yeah so eventually you can build them back to being able to exercise themselves right yes that would be the goal for sure mm -hmm. and uh so with this type of person you take them as far as they can go each time and try to increase with each treatment uh how long or how um how drastic the contrast is in the temperatures and uh, sort of have a, a goal with that and of course, that combined with, uh, with, as we say, physiotherapy, or you know, helping them mobilize, uh, whether they can sit in bed and swing their legs, or start putting weight on their legs and walking, or just whatever their their current disability is, and and, and see if we can't just advance them toward more no normal life. Mm -hmm. Yes, awesome. And um, blood pressure as well, same thing, Dr. Clark. Um, you mentioned it's good for blood pressure as well. So high blood pressure, um, is that what you meant? Like can we normalize high blood pressure with hydrotherapy again? Yes. Uh, so high blood pressure or, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Some of these natural interventions uh, work for both high and low blood pressure. <laughs> And uh, it's uh, more difficult to overdose on them, although it's not impossible. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, so let's just start with the high blood pressure. A lot of times high blood pressure can be blood congesting in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. The congesting of blood may be due to use of uh, certain stimulants, such as caffeine. The congestion of blood may be due to dehydration. So you'd start by uh, almost overhydrating them so that their blood vessels are all full of, of blood and there's no uh, tendency in the body to tighten up blood vessels because their they're wor body's worried about, uh, you know, uh, survival with low blood uh, uh, volume. And, um, and so then once you've uh, got their blood volume up, then doing... Uh, whole body warm treatment to make the blood all all circulate everywhere evenly. That would certainly be at the top of the list for getting the blood pressure down. If the blood pressure uh, uh, was uh, too low, uh, then definitely a cold mitten friction to any part of the body uh, or all the body. That will be very stimulating. Mm, yeah. I'll bring pressure up. Yes, very good. Thank you for that. And also, I wanted to clarify on a point you mentioned, Dr. Clark, about glaucoma and other issues with the eye. So I've got someone that was talking to me about having clouds in front of his eyes and he went to the doctor and yeah, he was prescribed certain things. And um, I told him about charcoal. And is that something that, again, charcoal poultices, can that be used on the eyes? And if yes, would you do it the same way that you prescribed, like in a bag, charcoal in a bag, like wet? Is that what you said, to be applied to the eyes? 
Yes, uh, that's the way I would do it. Uh, and um, you can either sew up a bag or or take the, sometimes we'll take the top border off of a pillowcase and it's all already sort of a bag already sewed up and you cut one end open and fill it with, with charcoal and anyway come up with a good cotton bag for your charcoal charcoal is activated charcoal like powder or or granular um some places you can buy it like it's used for fish aquariums you can buy it uh, at some health food shops as powder you can buy it online as powder anyway you fill this this bag with uh, charcoal powder fold it over and put a safety pin in or something so it'll all stay closed dip that in ice cold water so it's good and wet and then perhaps uh, dry it off enough so it won't be dripping everywhere and then you put that over the eyes they probably lean their head back and sort of sit there while you have their feet in the hot water and so the cold charcoal will tend to drive the blood out of the head so that it's not congested in the head. The charcoal itself will pull the inflammation out of the eyes, which might be causing glaucoma or pain or inflammation. Um, and uh, the result is, is that uh, you're treating the, the eye condition. And mm -hmm. so that can be very, very helpful. And how long would you leave it on, the, the cold especially on the eyes? What I'll do is I'll make the treatment about 20 minutes, but every four or five minutes I'll dip the, 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 the bag back in the cold water to make sure it stays cool. Mm -hmm. Stay cool. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Thank you for that. Oh, you're um, welcome. Okay. So we've got some, uh, some questions from our viewers as well. And one of the viewers says, what do you do for fungus or mold, metabolic acidosis, and losing bone in knee? Boy, those are three different big different things, aren't they? <laughs> 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 so let's start out with fungus and mold. Uh, first thing you want to do is make sure it's not in your environment. In other words, your house isn't moldy, your bathroom isn't moldy, you don't have mold in compost heaps around the house you want to make sure your your environment you live in and breathe in is is free of mold but let's say you have mold uh, in your body then definitely hot and cold treatments are def are part of the, the picture that we would use uh, uh, let's say it's in your lungs then if we're doing a hot and cold shower we would focus the hot on the lungs and the cold on the lungs uh, and uh, then end with cold after at least five uh, um, contrast uh, changes. Um, if the fungus or mold is in your toenails, that's a whole different uh, story. Probably means you're keeping your toes uh, too cool, your legs aren't staying warm enough. But we would do hot and cold treatments for that, along with other treatments. But uh, hot and cold treatments of the toenails, uh, we've had people who just, uh, start keeping their feet more warm and uh, the fungus went away. Uh, metabolic acidosis is usually a dietary problem. Uh, eating too much uh, food that causes acid. Foods that cause acid are like uh, cheese. Cheese is one of the most acidic foods you can eat. causes metabolic acidosis. And uh, in which case you end up with osteoporosis. You end up with more diseases as a result of that. Other foods that cause acidosis are any kind of animal protein, meat, eggs, milk, uh, dairy. Uh, those cause metabolic acidosis, so avoiding those. As far as water goes, uh, the more water you drink, the more it tends to temper uh, extremes in pH, and so you're diluting out the acidosis and helping by helping to wash it out the kidneys. So drinking lots of water is definitely part of the hydrotherapy. Uh, if you know there's a certain part of your body responsible for the acidosis, then we might treat that specifically. If you're having kidney failure, we do hot and cold treatments over the kidneys, which would be posterior or back. Uh, so those are some things about, about metabolic acidosis. As far as losing bone in the knee, uh, when we have uh, arthritis, when we have osteoporosis, when we have uh, knee pain, then we tend to do a couple things. One is we'll do overnight charcoal poultices on the knee, but we definitely do hot and cold treatments to the knee. 
Easy ways to do it are to use a shower hose, direct it at the knee, turn it on hot for three minutes, and cold for one minute, and repeat that five times. Otherwise, you can use a hot water bottle and an ice pack on the knee and uh, do three minutes hot with the hot water bottle and, uh, and one minute with the ice pack and alternate five times and with cold. Or you can get a bucket or trash can that's deep enough that uh, you stand in it and the water comes clear up over your knee. And that would be the most effective. And so you get a couple like, uh, you know, 80 liter trash cans or something and um, you put hot in one and cold in the other and same procedures we talked about with the hot and cold sits baths and as far as uh, knee arthritis uh, things that are very helpful for that are uh, pineapple helps reduce inflammation i'm talking eating the pineapple turmeric uh, eating the turmeric is very helpful for that as far as other poultices on it that are helpful are ginger poultice um anyway that's beyond therapy but uh, definitely the hot and cold treatments for the knee mm -hmm. and dr clark just a question on that as well can weight bearing exercises help with that bone loss just anywhere yes definitely and some people think it's too painful i can't walk on it well if it's not broken and it's not uh, you know collapsing if it still holds your weight then uh, pain may be a sign that you are rusting out, not wearing out. Mm -hmm. And so the activity will actually help to mobilize lymph, help to mobilize inflammation, help to bring in circulation. And over time, people who exercise, even though they have pain, they tend to improve and uh, they end up uh, with less pain, better activity levels, better able to climb stairs just because they got active again. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the same person says, thank you. This all resulted from GI issues. And you said they are connected as well, right? Yes, definitely. And um, so uh, what you want to do is clean up your diet and lifestyle and get the GI issues taken care of. Uh, that's sort of like uh, what I was talking about there with the guy with ulcerative colitis where we're doing hot and cold sits baths. But uh, if you go to my website, Site rev14.com and look under either reflux disease or autoimmune disease. We cover the uh, some GI issues there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, and um, thank you very much for that, Dr. Clark. Um, there is another question. Um, maybe you can address, please. And. Veronica says, can hydrotherapy help with menstrual cramps? Usually use a heating pad. Yes, indeed. And so what would we do for the menstrual cramps? Not cramps? Number one, you want to drink enough water so that you're well hydrated. Menstrual cramps are often the body responding to, to uh, localized uh, irritants, uh, either uh, from uh, acidosis or... Or, or hormonal uh, imbalances and so forth, uh, or bleeding. And so drinking plenty of water will help float away the inflammatory mediators. Uh, the second thing is the hot and cold sits baths are definitely in order. Now, if you're having severe pain, uh, starting with an ice pack for a while can be beneficial, but to getting to the hot and cold will help to mobilize the fluid, to bring in healing, to wash out inflammation, and to reduce pain. So definitely helpful for menstrual cramps. Um, and then thinking about menstrual cramps, and there's a lot of other things that might be playing into this. If you're low in iodine, your periods can be a lot worse than if you have sufficient iodine. And uh, so iodine issues play into this as well, but that's you know beyond hydrotherapy. Wow, that's good. And I've heard of casserole compresses as well, Dr. Clark, do they? Do you know if they would help? Castor oil is very good at mobilizing lymph. And so if it's related to lymph congestion, then castor oil can be very helpful. Um, otherwise, a lot of times the castor oil packs are applied warm. So it's really a way of applying heat or, or warmth. And so that can be, you know, uh, a beneficial part of the castor oil pack. 
Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And maybe we can address just one last question, Dr. Clark. And the person is saying, would calcium supplementation help or a trace mineral from seaweed with iodine? Oh. Or yeah, well, most of the time, uh, the uh, either arthritis or osteoporosis is not really a deficiency of calcium. Um, it's usually something in your lifestyle is destroying the body's use of the calcium. And it's usually from metabolic acidosis, as, as you mentioned there. So if you go to my presentation on my website on osteoporosis, uh, either the handout or a uh, video, then uh, it can be very helpful for you for sorting out to what might be making you lose calcium and uh, fix it from its cause uh, rather than just trying to put more calcium in there, see what happens to it. Mm -hmm. And is it wise, Dr. Clark, would you say to take calcium supplements because bones are not just calcium, right? But why is it that the doctors, usually that's the first thing that will um, prescribe, that they will prescribe and say, go take calcium supplements. Could it be other mineral issues as well, the, the other minerals in the bone? Definitely. There's other minerals that are, that are important. Um, but that said, uh, the question about calcium uh, supplements uh, is a very good one. Uh, most of the time, it's not a calcium deficiency disease. And if you take calcium supplements, uh, when I did some research on this, I uh, found out that about half the supplements out there uh, – even from the best of brands, had uh, heavy metals in the in the product. And so you weren't really made to run on pills. You know, if we're looking at this from a biblical point of view, there's very few places in the Bible where it says, put this in your mouth and you'll get better. <laughs> now, there's no real oral medications. It's, it's usually poultices or ointments or, or what they call uh, emollients, uh, emollified. Um, and so um, usually it's better to figure out, to, you know, your main, your main oral health uh, intervention is eating good food. And if you're eating good food, this sort of gets back to Hippocrates, right? To let food be thy medicine and medicine thy food. <laughs> uh, eat the right food and a lot of these other things will, will go away. So I would say better to work on diet than to try to find some supplement. Mm, absolutely. Um, wonderful. Well, we want to thank you very much again, Dr. Clark. This is really good information, really exciting, especially preparing for a time when we can use only the simple natural remedies. We know that we did go through a time where we, we couldn't go to pharmacies and just get whatever we wanted. So I think the knowledge is really important to learn all the, the simple remedies that a lot of the times don't cost us much so um, we want to thank you very much for that and um, we want to ask you to close with a word of prayer please yes let's bow our heads dear father in heaven it's good to be able to think together about the natural remedy you've given us of water and uh, the benefits to be gained not because uh, there's magic in water but because you've chosen water as one of your uh, means of healing. We think about Naaman who dipped in the river seven times, a bit of hydrotherapy, but it was what you asked him to do, and you did the healing because he did what you asked him to do. Lord, we pray that we'll look to you for healing, and that when you ask us to do something in that line, that we will respond positively and uh, do it with all our hearts and expect the results that uh, you have promised. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you again, Dr. Clark. Um, you have a blessed new year as um, when it comes. <laughs> so um, we're looking forward to seeing you in the new year. And um, yeah, we will keep everyone updated about what presentation will be the next one. So may God bless you and we will see you next time. Amen. Okay, um, we want to thank everyone for 
joining today. Please remember that any questions you may have for us or for our speakers, uh, you can write to us at techchargeofyourhealth101 at gmail.com. And please pray for the ministry. Please pray for everyone who is ministering today. And um, yeah, um, may you all have a blessed new year as we enter into the new year. And um, yeah, thank you for your support and prayers and everything in this in this year. Like I said, look out for um, news about our upcoming presentations because we will take maybe a little bit of a break and then we will be back again um, sharing more good news. Share with others as well and join our online community. And if you want to be in um, included in our newsletter, our weekly newsletter, just email us. Again, I take charge of your health101 at gmail.com and um, we will send you updates and upcoming presentations. So God bless you and see you next time.